Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about unique identifiers. And these are pretty commonplace in taxonomies, knowledge graphs, ontologies, linked data models, they're pretty important. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what that means. There are really three different types of unique identifiers. The first is not actually unique, it might seem like it is, but these are usually the things that we label things in databases. So these could be a random string of numbers and letters. They might not be unique across all of your databases or across all of your data. So that's why, yes, they are IDs. And if you don't have anything else, that's a good start, but they're not unique. Having something that's unique is incredibly important. A number of reasons, like over here. And I have a lot of videos also talking about why they are so important. So let's talk about the first type of ID, that it's usually things that are a string of letters and or numbers, and they're not always unique. So this is something that is probably the most common. It does help in your own systems, but it doesn't really help you string things across different systems. It can also hurt you in the long run if you are migrating to other systems that do use unique identifiers. You're gonna have to go and change those. So just keep that in mind if you are using IDs and not unique IDs. The next kind is an actual unique ID. So what makes it unique? So unique IDs are usually things that have either a key value or a name value pair. Common examples of that are over here are the Library of Congress subject headings. You could even say that when you're doing linked data schema like Dublin Core or SCOS or RDF, those are also sort of like key value pairs. Um, the most common that I would say are things that use letters in the beginning of the ID followed by a sequence of numbers. And these are registered. So that's something that you have to keep in mind if you are doing a unique identifier. You have to have something that's keeping track of all those unique IDs so that you don't reuse them. A lot of people use random generators for these that use the logic that they have in mind. And that's something I'm actually, again, a very big believer in is not just having a random string of letters and a random string of numbers, but making them mean something. Whatever you end up choosing, if you have logic behind it, that will also help you dictate logic for consecutive types of unique IDs. It will also help you grow with how, however your collection is going to grow. Now we're talking right now about the unique identifiers for your internal use. So there are five levels of linked data and there are five levels of linked vocabulary data. So I'm not going to go over all of those in this video. I'm gonna have a whole video dedicated to that. But suffice it to say, you can have unique identifiers that really only are unique to your internal systems. They could even be unique only to one system. But again, you're kind of going back into the regular ID in that situation. If you have unique identifiers across all of your different databases, systems, protocols, different product lines, then you will be a lot better off because they are unique if they ever need to be queried. You can use that same logic that you're building in from the letters and the numbers so that people don't have to go and scrounge around and find the right person to ask, how do I find this unique ID? How do I know what the unique ID is? How do I query for it? At least they have some semblance of understanding because you've added logic into the name value pair. The other thing to keep in mind is these can take two different types of formats. So these formats are things that are um, either in the actual field of your metadata schema. And so this could be like DC identifier or one of the other schema labels for a unique ID, or these could be URL slash URIs. So I say this because URLs are essentially what it looks like. But the reason that we say URI, even though they look like a URL, when you have a URI, it doesn't actually need to resolve 
from a website or to a website, I should say. So it looks like a URL, it acts like a URL, but it doesn't actually resolve as a URL, essentially. Um, and so a big reason that things are still structured as if they are a URL is because the father of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee, described the linking between different websites as a way of creating the web, and that's why we have it today. So URLs are a form of unique ID. So the third type is called a cool URL. So a cool URL was defined, I believe, in 1998, again, by Tim Berners-Lee, where they are essentially unique IDs that are so unique they can never be really corrupted or um, have URI rot, essentially. So what's URI rot? Have you ever tried to find a URL that didn't go anywhere? Have you ever tried to follow a URL that you were really desperate to find what was at the other end and you got some kind of error? That's because that URL is either not valid anymore, something has changed in the protocol somewhere else, maybe they've added HTTPS um, or some other kind of logic. Um, a, a famous one in my background was um, a publisher that I was working for back in the day decided, rightly so, to have the DOI, which is the Digital Object Identifier. That, by the way, is a cool URL, or a cool ID at least. Um, they decided to put the DOI at the end of the URL for their um, for sale publications. The problem was they had a lot of legacy content that didn't have those IDs. So anybody that had some of those old URLs, they no longer worked. So there are ways to get around that. You can do some mapping mechanisms. You can do some things on a proxy, but just keep in mind, having cool URIs, cool URLs. But once you make the transition, you have to make sure that there's some kind of mechanism in place for old URLs that you have. Now, I did mention DOIs, Digital Object Identifier. Those are used mostly for published materials. So not just books, not just research articles like you would find in a journal article, but these are also on um, movies and you know different kind of, of media. They're on standards, um, regulations. There's a number of things can have DOIs. I will link the Crossref uh, website down below so you can go and check out all the different types that uh, they have. And the way that a DOI works is it is registered. And that's why whether it's internal, you're registering somewhere on your own systems or external, like a DOI where it's registered in a public location, it's important that when you're talking about unique identifiers that they are registered somewhere so people understand what the logic is and they can do validation to make sure that if they are also trying to make a unique ID, they're not taking your unique ID and therefore invalidating both of the IDs that you have. So DOI is a good example of these. Um, some other IDs that are out there that are good to look at for examples. So an ORCID, that is something that is used for authors. And so these would be things like, I know Scopus, which is um, another type of research um, database, those have IDs and then even unique IDs per institution. If you're at either a corporate or, a, or an academic institution, sometimes you have internal IDs on your student ID or your faculty ID. Those are IDs indicating who you are uniquely, but they might only be unique to your school or to your institution, not necessarily unique to the world, which is what ORCID is trying to do. By the way, if you are an author and you don't have an ORCID ID yet, please go sign up for one because we will all appreciate it very much. Some other types of IDs, people IDs, right? Your social security number, that's a unique ID. There are other types of networks out there that are using unique IDs. If you don't know what kind of unique ID they are using, if they have an API, you can go and look at the API documentation and you can usually find out. So LinkedIn, for instance, has an API to use LinkedIn information. 
So if you don't know what the unique ID schema or logic is for LinkedIn, you can go and look at their API documentation and find that out. So that's a tip. If you don't know what is already out there for an institution or for a process that you want to pull in IDs, that's one way to do it. By the way, most people only worry about unique IDs internally. Even when you use linked data and you pull that linked data in from other resources, so other places that you'll find unique IDs are Wikidata, uh, Wikipedia, uh, sources online um, have unique IDs, WordNet is another one. These all are external. Now they are not always unique between each other, so you do have to be careful of conflict. So if you are bringing in unique IDs from other repositories that are external to your own internal repository, make sure that you're doing a mapping and not an overwrite because you don't want to overwrite their IDs and make them your IDs unless you're purposely doing that. Maybe you're just using Wikidata as is, but you do want to make sure that your systems are not connected to somebody else's logic out there in the world. You want to make sure that they are your unique IDs. And if you need them to be unique in the outside world, then you can do that. So usually when you're looking at a cool ID, it is unique because of the registration process, not necessarily because of the way that you form that unique ID. So there are standards on how to create a unique ID. There are validations on unique IDs, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. But primarily, you can look at product unique IDs. These are model numbers, product numbers, SKUs, or the uh, barcodes. Those are also can be considered unique IDs. Um, some for people that we have mentioned are ORCID, your social security number. Um, if you have LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter, Twitter, that's a unique ID that is more on the universal side because it's being used all over the place. Um, your Google account number, that could also be considered unique, even though it's not necessarily an ID. These are things that are used cross-platform. So the more unique you have, the better off you are with linking with other resources, databases, and systems. But remember, you have to register them in order to keep them straight and in order to validate them if somebody wants to use yours or if you want to use somebody else's because you don't want to have those conflicts. Unique means it really is unique. Nothing else in your system has it. So therefore, you have to do some kind of checks and balances to make sure that's going to be accurate. I hope you have enjoyed these examples that I have gone through. And with that, I wish you many years of beautiful, unique IDs and let the validation always be in your favor. Yeah, been watching The Hunger Games. Okay, so with that, thank you very much and I will catch you next time.